Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so today we're just going to talk, like briefly talk mostly about the different methods for resampling. So one way is usually when we decided to, we have the data set, we decided to split into testing data as well as the training data, right? Training and testing. So, but then before you want to use it with the test set, you need to decide on what is the best model to use it. So, how can we evaluate whether which is the final model to use with the test set is we might consider using like this resampling method to measure the performance reliability. So there are few learning objectives. <clears throat> the first one, we want to recognize why some naive performance estimates can often fit. And this refers to using the resubstitution method. Okay, means you are using the same data sets for your testing as well as for your training, training and testing. So the best way to counter for this is using a resampling method, which is you divide the training sets into an analysis and where you have the assessment set. So the most commonly used one is we are using a cross validations. Even for cross validation methods, there are numerous variations. So we're going to talk about the common one, common cross-validation method, <clears throat> and also um, talk about what's the benefit of using each of these cross-validation methods. So you can also have a something called divide a non-testing set into one a single training set and single validation set. So this one, later on, I will show you guys the figure, but for the training sets, you can have one is just for purely training the performance one model. And validation sets will only give you one single matrix, performance matrix. Okay, that's also another way of doing resampling, which is the bootstrap methods. And then for those uh, temporal sensitive um, data sets, so time sensitive, you might want to consider <coughs> using rolling forecast origin resampling. Then we're going to talk about each how we can use this uh, resampling shows method then to estimate the model performance. So we will be using the tune package and in the tune package, you have this fit resamples where you can fit multiple models for resample data sets. You can use the collect matrices that's to measure the model performance and to collect predictions to analyze whether your predictions, how accurate it is. Then final one, we go just go into briefly, very briefly talk about parallel processing, how you can use it to speed up your computation processes. And also for certain people who might want to, because during when we're doing the resampling, you will not save the resample data sets. So we will talk about, okay, how you can use like save the model objects to save out the data sets, the model that you think you might need to use again, some models that you think is the better one. Okay, so let's talk about first uh, why resubstitution is best. So, so as mentioned earlier in the previous previous chapters, so we are not supposed to touch the test set until you have chosen a candidate model. So what happens is usually when you have a huge data set, you might want to split it to 730 or 80-20. So 80%, let's say 80% you split it for the training sets. And these training sets can be further split into like the training, one or the, the other validation one, which we will talk about that later. But you can use this training sets one, you split it into this training data sets. You want it to use it to train the model. And once you train the model, you will need to evaluate how this performance, the model, how the, um, the model that you have decided perform on the training data set, which gets you some like, estimates of the model performance. So if it's not good, so this is a very iterative process. You will go back to the training sets, then you train the model. So you will have multiple uh, model performance estimates. And using this, you will get an average. And that will be a single matrix performance. So once you have decided on your model, 
you want to use your testing set, which is the unseen data, and test the model and then evaluate the model performance. Okay. So let's talk about why we need to have separate data sets for training and also for testing. So if you use the same data sets, that's what we call as resubstitution approach. So to illustrate the example why that is a bad idea to use the same data sets, here is like one of the previous model from the Amos data set. <clears throat> they are trying to predict the sales price um, without using the resampling one. What you have is the neighborhood. Here they have the train and the test. So here you have neighborhood, the living area, your build, building type, the <coughs> locations using the Amos training set. And here you are using a linear regressions and the set engine using linear model. And then you try to fit it. So the other one without using resampling, you can fit the other one using a random forest model. <laughs> and in random forest model, it's just a multiple decision tree where then you set it using the ranger package and the mode is regression. So you can compare the performance of these two candidate models using the function here. And what you can get is the resubstitutions error for the linear model is you will get the estimate of RMSE is about 0 0.075. And this one is about 0 0.819. Mm. Let me see. Mm. We can see that the, um, I'm sorry. Then this, the resubstitution error, this is, I think this is for the forest data set, right? Oh yeah, this is the random forest one. Random forest one, it has the better estimate the IMSE. So IMSE is the square root of variance of the residual. So it means that you want to see how close the data sets to the model value. So what you want is actually a lower value of IMSE. This one, I think is a R square. R square is the better the higher, the better it is, which is in second one in the random forest. What you can see is random forest is a better model compared to linear model. So we can see that the random forest models perform significantly better in terms of the RMSE. It is twice lower, two times lower. And the R square is also a better fit. And then when you test the performance, what you have is, I think this is different. So when you test, you estimate the performance of, you test it on the training data set, yeah. So this one is on the trade, one is on the, training set from the training set it seems that the random forest is a better one then if you use it you realize that sorry let me check my code again <laughs> Um, mailing, I think the issue is that um, when you estimate the, the random forest model on the um, training set, then it, it has very good uh, estimates, like uh, low RMSC and high uh, R square. But mm -hmm. when you do it on the test uh, set, uh, then the RMSC is much higher. 
the R square is much lower. So these are like um, worse. Uh, yeah. So you are right. So, okay. So based on the training data set, the, <clears throat> the random forest seems to be a better model. They have very low RMSE and also higher R square. And then when we test it on the testing set, the IMSE suddenly increased to 0 0.07. Okay, so this is because we are using the resubstitution method. So what happens is they want to talk about something called the... Um, so they talk about results. So this is considered something about the low bias models versus the high bias models. So linear model is considered a high bias models and then random forest models are considered low bias models, it means less complex. So in this case, most of the machine learning models are usually low bias. So it means that they tend to um, emulate the data set. So when you're trying to re-predicting the training set, do you get a very bad performance evaluation? So one thing is they suggest that we need, that's why that's the reason why we need to use the resampling methods. So next one. <clears throat> So this is a very nice diagram compared to the one that in the book, but they are quite similar. So what happens in in resampling method, you have the data sets where you split into the training and testing data. Then during the, you have, when you have the training data, you might want to resample it multiple times. So for each resampling, the model will be fit using, you have two sets. One is the analysis and one is the assessment set. So each model will be fit using an analysis, their own analysis set, and the model will be evaluated using the assessment set. The test set is not, this test data set is not involved at all. So, the two subset, what we will call as the fitting set versus the assessment set, they are very similar to these training and test sets. And these data sets are usually mutually exclusive. So we will use a certain partitioning to separate, to create the analysis and the assessment set. So for example, let's say we have 20 resamplings, let's say we conducted a 20 resamplings, <clears throat> means that we will have 20 separate models and they will be fit onto the analysis set. You will have 20 separate models fit on the analysis set. Correspondingly, you also have 20 sets of performance statistics. Then in order for you get to get the final estimates <clears throat> of the performance, you will get the average of the 20 replicates of the assessment statistics. So these methods, these averaging methods seems to have a better properties and is better than the resubstitution estimates. So um, it can, I provided, like I said, it can be reiterated 20 times, but it can be repeated as many times as you want. Um, then there are a few ways that we can create this analysis and the evaluation sets. And the common one is usually the cross validations. Even for cross validations, there are multiple variations. So we're going to talk through each cross validation method slowly. So the most common, popular one the, is the WIFO cross-validations. 
In this figure that you will see, this is V equals to 3, which is 4, 3. This is just for illustration purpose to explain what is the concept. But um, it's not being, it's not, you are not encouraged to set the V sets to 3 folds. So what they note is they will say um, threefold is just good for illustration purpose, but it's not good in practice. You need at least minimum five or ten folds is the standard one. So, but back to this. So imagine you have these data sets. Okay. And let's say you divided your data sets into like 30, um, 30 samples. So you can see, let's say three folds, you will have equal um, number of analysis set and equal number of performance uh, assessment sets. So you have one to 30, the numbers are, are usually samples. Are, let's say you only have one to 30 samples. You will have, you divided, let's say two third into the fit set fitting set and this one is one third on the perform uh, assessment set so then in the next fold in the second fold in the next iteration you will have different samples but then these times you will have different like two third on the fit and one third is on the assessment as well uh, <coughs> So the process will continue because we set it to three. So the process will continue for until we got a four of three. So then this will produce three sets of performance statistics for us. Okay, so you can see they are mutually exclusive, means the one that you use for fit uh, sets, you won't use it for and which is you, the one that you use for analysis set, you won't use it for the assessment set. And so the next one, <coughs> how you can do this VFO is you can use this function VFO underscore CV cross validations on the training data set and you set it to V10. Oh, the on top one is V3, but this one is V10, the example. And then what happens is you can see under here, they will split it 10 times. Each time they will have different. So the total here, the 2107 here refers to the, uh, the fit one, uh, which is the, what was it called? <laughs> Uh, the, it's called the, for the analysis, and this one is for the assessment, 235. On average, you have like 235 for assessment, but sometimes here you get 234. But overall, you have 10 fold, which is V10. Okay, so it's about 2000 in the fit analysis, then about 200 plus is in the assessment. So there's also the concept of you can also consider using stratified sampling where you have very unequal data sets. Next one is the repeated cross validation. So what happens with the standard um, cross validation, VFO cross validations is they will might produce a lot of noisy estimates. So depending on the data size and other characteristics, right? So the resampling estimates produced might be very noisy. So as the problem to reduce noise, usually we might want to have more data sets. So it means you need to gather more data. But rather than that, what you can do is do a repeated cross validations. So just do a V10, repeats 10, repeats five, which is, then you will get a matrix of 10 times five, which is about 50 times of resampling. So it means that you want to have create more average than the V statistics. Okay, so the same full process, 
to do this repeated cross validation, you're doing the same processes. You just do it repeatedly how many times? In this case, we repeat it five times. Okay, due to they talk about something about central limit theorem, where if you repeat it multiple times, the summary statistics that you get from the model will tend to move towards a normal distribution as long as you have more data. There was a, I think there is a picture on the book where they talk about the sigma, but it's, I don't think I see it here. <coughs> so let me think, um, let me see. <laughs> so they say on average, the tenfold cost validations, they will have roughly about two, three, four properties for your assessments. So if you, consider RMSD as the statistics, and then we can get the stigma, uh, sigma, which is the standard deviation. So with tenfold cross validation, your standard error is sigma divided by square root 10. And if this is too noisy, if you repeat it five times, you will have to, you can do sigma, you will get, you will reduce your standard error to sigma divide square root 10 times 5, which is 50, so square root 50. And that your standard error will quickly decreases as your number of repeats increases. I will try to wait, huh? let me find that thing diagram. Uh, I think it's somewhere. Um, <coughs> ah, this one. So as you can see, the number of cross-validation replicates increases. The sigma multiplied should be decreasing. Then, um, so when you, why this happens is because um, a large number of replicates usually tend to have less impact on the standard error. However, if you have really, really huge baseline value of your sigma, they, they still say it's worth doing these repeat, repeats because uh, it will still reduce your standard error. The other one is leave one out cross validations. Okay, so for this one, there's no information here. Uh, so leave one out, um, leave one out cross validation is where let's say you decided to do n trading set sample. Leave one out is just n minus one. So your model, what you do is the each model the will predict the single excluded data point, the minus one, the one that you use to predict. So at the end of the resampling, let's say you do 100. So that will be 100 minus 1, you will have 99. And then you have 99 predictions. We have these 99 predictions were pulled together, averaged together, to produce one single performance matrix. Here, they didn't have information because this is not a good idea. <laughs> Why? Because one is computationally expensive. It really takes up time. And it only works, I think, for really small sample size. <laughs> so it would not have a very good statistical properties. That's why this is 
not a good idea. So we're going to skip this one too. Then we're going to move to, <coughs> excuse me, let me drink one. <sighs> Uh, can I just um, uh, so I'll give you the time to uh, like uh, refresh a bit. Um, just uh, to to add a um, personal uh, so experience that I had following one of a webinar on spatial data, uh, and uh, they so when you do spatial data, you do spatial cross validation, okay. So, and they, in, on, on this webinar, they, they, then I'll search it, and if I'm able to find it quickly, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, but basically, they discussed the, the presented this um, uh, as it was uh, innovation, okay, innovative idea, to use cross-validation within spatial data and leave one out, okay? So, spatial data, cross-validation, leave one out, cross-validation. Basically, they you, you imagine in spatial data you have this uh, uh, imagine a, uh, an area di divided within uh, different polygons, and so they uh, taken out one polygon and then uh, cross validated all the others, uh, and then put the things uh, back on and uh, uh, randomly choose another one, and, and so on and so. On. So that, that was helpful for them to identify uh, some species in a, a particular uh, uh, subsection of the main area. Uh, and so taking one piece off, uh, one polygon, um, so one piece off, uh, of the, the main area uh, was actually uh, resulted to be helpful because uh, the probability to find that species within a certain area uh, was, resulted as to be like different uh, because some, somehow the species were located um, uh, in some specific sub areas more than the entire area. So they want to be able to locate where they actually were or most probably would be. Uh, and so they, they presented this uh, as a uh, some time ago uh, as an innovative uh, way to to do this sort of um, this this uh, um, analysis, this uh, species loc location prediction, uh, and so this is called like uh, spatial cross validation. The one out. Okay, today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, now I'll search it. See um, uh, if if I'm able to find it. I'll put it in the chat. But because it's it's a nice nice discussion. The sad the fact that they are talking about spatial data, but uh, uh, it is um, lets you in uh, somehow understanding what's happening uh, when they you actually take a piece of uh, of your data and work out on the others, and then uh, it uh, um, okay. So um, I suggest to, to have a look if you if you got some uh, like time. Um, <clears throat> I can think why like why the leave one out cross validation would work in that specific case because I think when they start out the modeling they have a very specific areas so that's why they're able to do it like they have a very clear purpose but I think for most modeling that we are trying to do is we roughly have a hypothesis of things that we wanted to predict, but most of the time we are still looking for the predictors, like the best predictors to predict the variables that we want. That's why I think that's why like why Max and Julia, they didn't really encourage this, like leave one out uh, cross validations. But I agree that it could be helpful in certain very specific cases. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to um, this one is Monte Carlo cross validations. Okay, so this is like 
Hmm, this is like um, a, a variation of a V4 cross validation. So this is quite popular. So what happens is like the V4 cross validations, it allocates a specific proportions of the data to the assessment and specific proportions to the analysis set. The difference with this Monte Carlo versus the regular cross validations is the proportion of data is randomly selected each time. So it means that for your assessment sets, you will not have a mutually exclusive samples. So, as you can see, when you have a proportion that say 9, 10, right? If you look into it with 20 resampling, you might have like some of the data sets appearing in the assessment and then some appearing in the analysis part. I think that's what they meant. <coughs> uh, what else uh, for Monte Carlo? Uh, but then you will have a uh, same size for your analysis and your assessment set. And the next one is this validations. So for a very, very huge data set, you might want to consider doing another validation sets. Validation sets will only give you a single performance metric. And this is a very, something that you should consider if you have a very big data set. So what happens is here they divide into three parts, but what happens is you actually divide it into. So first the data, you will split it into training, then and testing. Then under training, you will split it into the, specifically the model training, and another one is for validations. So it's not like three parts like this. It should be data split into training and testing. Then under training, you have one specifically for the analysis and assessment. Another one is just for validation. So how you can create a validation um, sets is you can use the validation split function and you can say you want to split it if let's say 75, 25%. In this case, they set it three to four. So means about 75 used for training and then this 25%, which is for your validation. The next one is bootstrapping. You can use it to estimate the model performance and it has a lower variances. Um, oops, in bootstrapping, you usually do it with, you will have the same size, like your bootstrap sample will have the same size as training sets, but then you are always keep drawing it with replacements. Means the data might not be mutually exclusive. So some data points will have the chances of being included into the training sets more than once. So for example, in this diagram, you can see that, let's say, we have, we fit it using 30 data sets, 30 samples. Then you might have, you estimate the performance using the data points that you have not previously included. But then when you fit the model during in this analysis part, you might use the data point more than once because we are drawing the data point with replacements means after you draw, you keep putting it back. So they may be selected multiple points. Uh, so these assessment sets, usually this estimate first one is also called out of the back sample because this is, you use excluded data point. Um, one thing to note is, Compared to other methods, you might realize that the size of the assessment sets are not the same size because here you might have more 
compared to the regular where you have a very fixed uh, size for your assessment. But here you have different size for assessment. Set. Um, we can perform the bootstrapping resamplings uh, using the bootstraps and you can times it with how many times. And if you need to conduct a stratified sampling, you can use the strata acumen as well. Then you will see here, the total should be the same, but here you will see the assessment size is different. Here's got 830, 867, then 856. So each time your assessment resampling is very different. Uh, What's good about bootstrap samples is, as mentioned, it produces an estimate that has very low variances, unlike cross-validation. Cross-validation has higher variances. But one thing is they talk about pessimistic bias. It has significant pessimistic bias. What that means is, if your true accuracy of the model is 90%, your bootstrap methods would tend to estimate your value, be more pessimistic, it will tend to underestimate it. So it will estimate the accuracy less than 90%. And this amount of bias actually also, additionally, the amount of bias also changes accordingly, depending of your performance metrics. If your accuracy is 90, your amount of bias is different compared to when your accuracy of the true accuracy is 70. Um, but a lot of models actually using these bootstrap methods. So like for example, the random forest methods. Mm. Then, this one is the one that I didn't really get is, but the rough idea is um, when you want to do resampling with time series data, you need a special setup. Because if you just do the normal resampling, you tend to ignore those like uh, temporal data trends. So one thing is you can use something called rolling forecasting origin recently. So it involves specifying the size of the analysis and the assessment sets prior before each iteration. Then after each iteration, you will skip it by a set of numbers. So this one is skipping by one, but the idea is roughly the same. You can usually skip by, instead of using days like one, you can skip by whole month, like 30 days. Or maybe if you have a very long year, you can skip by yearly. So what happens, let's say your original data is one to 15 ordered in time. In the first resample, you might resample eight for analysis, then three for estimates. Uh, the assessment part. After that, the next resample, because we're skipping by one, the next resample, you will move forward one. Now you start from two to nine, then you have 10 to 12. Okay, so this method is a good method, especially when you want to estimate uh, models with historical data and then you want to evaluate it with recent data. So for, just to be clarified, for this type of resampling, when you want to set the size of the analysis, you need to set it higher, like initially. So how you can do it is, you can do initial five, then you have assessment one, then Cumulative stands for, I don't remember, let me think. <laughs> uh, cumulative stands for if you want the analysis resample to grow beyond. So usually we will set it to true because you might want to go to go beyond unless you want it to stay within a certain range of data. 
uh, we use this is done i think is in resample package let me also think awesome. mm, so first you want to set this the initial is the number of samples to be used with the analysis then <clears throat> for each assessment is you want to say how many in your assessment and then cumulative is you want the analysis resample whether to go beyond means the initial that you have set up there's also other arguments like skip and lag. <clears throat> so any of these, okay, any of these resampling methods, right? Including the pre-processing model fitting, right? These methods are all effective because you use a different data sets to train the model as well as to assess the model. So during resampling, what happens is you use the analysis set to pre-process the data, apply the pre-processing, and then use the pre-processing to fit the model. Whereas from then you have from the pre-processing statistics, you produce an analysis set, and then you use the predictions to estimate the performance. So one thing that you want to use, the most important one is the fit resamples. Once you have done the resampling, you can use fit resamples, resamples whatever resampling method that you have chosen. And then this kit prep is okay. This kit prep, um, so on. The okay, here this one is from here you have another function called control resampler where you can save your predictions for the model and also you can save the workflow for the model. And then when you run the fit resampler, you can use the Amos, the resampling method that cross the whichever cross validation as say you selected tenfold cross validation then you can use your control using this okay then final one we're just going to very briefly touch about parallel processing so in the book there's a whole section talking about how you can do parallel processing using uh, the package. So you can use the parallel backend R package too, but in order for you to do that, you need to configure that first. The whole operating systems, depending on which systems you're using, they have all the guideline using. So it's supposed to help you to speed up the computation processes. Next one, you also might want to consider, let's say, most of the models created when you're doing the resampling, they were not safe because you are not interested. Uh, well, because, no, because we are only interested in the performance uh, matrices. So sometimes you realize that specific models might be the best one, and you might want to save it so you can fit it again for the whole training data set. There's a method to save the model, which also outlined in the book, which I don't think we have time to go through. So that's it. <laughs> and one thing is when you guys, I forgot to mention, is when you run the, after you run the resamples, right, you might want to just have a pick, a figure out looking at the residual to see whether you have any outliers then i think in the book there's a section where they talk about how looking into certain data points and why those data points are not a good predictor of the model then look into that specific data it might help to explain 
why your model might not fit all the cases. So that's all. You guys have any other question? <coughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mei Ling. Um, I, I do have one question, uh, either for you or maybe, maybe Federica as an experienced statistician. Um, I was wondering um, when is it proper or more proper to use the Monte Carlo uh, default cross validation rather than the, uh, let's say, regular or re repeated default cross validation? Um, I, as I understand from the book, the, let's say, um, uh, basic, most recommended, um, uh, like fits almost all cases is that like v fold cross validation. And if you have uh, computing power, then it, it is recommended to use the repeated um, v fold cross validation. But um, when, like, um, in, in what uh, specific use cases is the Monte Carlo um, more adequate? Actually, I do not have the answer because I was wondering the same thing. But for me, as I was reading the book, I felt that the V-fold is the most conservative one and also the easiest to use. Like Monte Carlo sounds like more computationally expensive. It will take longer time to run and bootstraps as well. But for me, in this case, I don't think that's actually the best methods or I feel like with different data sets, you have to try different resampling method. Then check the performance matrices and see which one seems to predict the uh, testing data sets better. Like, what do you think, Frederick? <laughs> yeah, um, I agree absolutely with you. Uh, obviously, if you have already an idea for what you are going to um to use uh, but otherwise you uh, you should try different things and see your model performance but uh, you should start with cross validation usually use uh, monte carlo uh, because it's involved like so probabilities and uh, it is a uh, like simulating um um the the, the uh, like simulating uh the 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 data set um and so it is computationally expensive but somehow can be more precise in terms of of uh, uh providing data set that are more suitable to use with your model. So they provide um, um, a, a, a different, uh, it, they, they, they are little differences, but they can make, uh, they um, might release different results. For example, bootstrapping, uh, it, whether you can use uh, it's, uh, um, as well, competition is expensive because um, it does more, um, it allows for replications and cross validation with replication is slightly different from bootstrapping, it's not bootstrapping. Uh, so going uh, inside the, the differences of these three, for example, um, uh, it can be done. So if you want to, we can uh, uh, like uh, do that next time. Uh, because it's even interesting to me to, uh, I usually uh, decide to use cross validation for a certain type of data that not require uh, like forecastings, um, um, strict forecasting. 
Otherwise, I, I use Monte Carlo because I want to be able to simulate uh, the data uh, more times. And so, and the bootstrapping as well, it's somehow included within Monte Carlo. And it's, it's a, some, somehow cross replication in Monte Carlo. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it is in between, basically, between cross replication and Monte Carlo. It's a, it's it depends by uh, I don't know mm, I think uh, um, the the techniques that you want to to apply and the type of data the type of data as well are, are uh, important for for choosing the, the among these uh, techniques this cross validation validation techniques. Okay, thank even you. The, yeah, even the models. Answer. Yeah, even the models sometimes that you choose to use uh, allows you for some types of cross validations. So, uh, yeah, no, because I'm interesting uh, uh, about those things as well. So, if you'd like to go a bit more in deep uh, on those things, we could like even choose a data set and and test. Uh, different type of um, resamplings uh, with this data set and see what happens. Yeah. Um, Federica, you're muted, I guess. Yes, I am. So next week, uh, uh, it's uh, all of Emmy. Is that right? <laughs> yes, you are right. Okay. We have, uh, thank you. We have no one for model tuning and the dangers of overfitting. So we may um, uh, catch up on Slack and see if. Um, Maybe. Um, I think I can I can try and uh, I'll uh, I'll sign up for this one. Okay, that's great. So we we're done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>